Thank you everyone for joining us for our Book Brush video podcast, where we talk with authors all about their craft, how they market their books, and how they make it in this crazy world of independent and traditional and everything in between publishing to get their art out there. Today, I have Jessie Gussman with me, who has over 100 titles to her name and is quite the prolific author. She writes primarily sweet romance. She has a couple of series out. One is a cowboy series. One is a lady who lives in Good Grief, Indiana. And uh, she has a little line in her bio that I just absolutely have to ask her about. She says that her main goal is to keep herself from catching on fire, dot, 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 again. So Jesse, thank you so much for being here. Please don't catch on fire. And I got to ask you about the first time this happened. Oh, yeah. No, that's a great story. Um, if you if if readers have joined my newsletter, they're probably going to read it because it's in my it's it's one of the first new newsletters that I'll send them. But it's just basically I was uh, my daughter was trying to light a candle and I was like, it's not that hard to light a candle, honey. Let me show you how. And I was <laughs> so to strike the match and strike the match and strike the match and nothing was happening. Then finally I struck the match and it broke in two and I was holding one piece and the lit piece dropped on my lap and she was laughing too hard to uh, to blow it out. So, and, but she was leaning over top of me so I couldn't blow it out. So I'm like smelling that my clothes are on fire. I know that I'm on fire and like, my daughter thinks it's hilarious. So yeah, that was kind of like the whole. Yeah, it's always the, the pride cometh before fall situation. <laughs> right, and exactly. don't mix that with fire. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you nailed it, yep. So tell me a little bit about your story of how you became an author. Were you always a writer? Did you, you know, how did you, how did you start your career? Well, no, I was not always a, an, a writer. I didn't wasn't one of those people who dreamed the dream of, oh, someday I want to grow up and write and that type of thing. I mean, I wrote OK in school and got A's and stuff like that. But it was um, 2013 in February, and I was sitting on the couch. And it was like um, whenever, I don't know, before I got my Kindle, I was reading on my laptop. And I slammed my laptop closed. And I said just to the room in general, anybody can write a better book than that. And I was just frustrated with what I was reading. And my husband happened to be walking through the room. We had maple sap boiling outside. He was going out to check on it. And he stopped and he turned and he said, well, why don't you? And I was like, I don't know whether I can write a book or not. But for about five years, I worked on writing. I wrote over a million words and five books that will never see the light of day. And then I finally published. So that's my story. So what was the difference between those first five books that will never see the light of day and the first one where you felt confident enough, like, I'm ready to put this out for my readers and see if other people will really enjoy this book too? Well, that's a good question. I think I did a lot of all the things that a writer is not supposed to do in a novel, and people who read novels probably know that. But um, when I started to write, those were, were things that I didn't really realize um, that needed to be done. And even though some of the things were kind of intrinsic because I had read so many books, um, like head hopping, uh, passive tense, even mm. story structure, like I just kind of went on and on and on and on and there was no like goal, you know, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you can break those rules, but it's kind of like they say you have to learn the rules and know what they are before you can learn how to break them the right way. So that's kind of yeah. where those things are. So as someone who, you know, you had your life outside of writing, you had all your life responsibilities, I, you're a mom, you're a wife, you have all of these things. What does carving out time look like for someone like you who does write so so much, you're so prolific, and what is your encouragement to other people who are looking to jump in, who have this desire to write, and they probably feel like my life is so full, I have all of these other things. How do you carve out time? Well, to begin with, when I started, I, um, got up at four o'clock in the morning and that's that was my writing time because you're right it's hard to carve that kind of time out um you know when you're a wife and you're a mom and I've homeschooled and we had businesses and that type of thing um but as it as that grew and I started to make money with my books it started to be like oh this is a legitimate thing you know you can't interrupt mom when she's writing and that type of thing and I wish that 
I guess I don't wish. I, I, I appreciate the interruptions from my kids because I know that they're not always going to be around. So they, I do get interrupted and you just kind of have to learn to write through those interruptions. But um, it's a sacrifice. Like sometimes I'm inside writing when everybody else is outside working and um, or doing things or instead of doing some of the things that I used to do, like I gave up gardening and I didn't write or didn't garden for years because I was a writer. So just different things. You you have to make the time. If you're going to do it, that's the one thing that you have to make time for. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of your businesses and your life outside of uh, writing, tell us a little bit about how your life informs the books that you write. Well, I probably couldn't write the books that I write if I didn't have the life that I did. I mean, obviously I'd write something different or maybe nothing at all, but um, I live on a farm and cowboys were uh, kind of a hot topic whenever I first started writing. They were a trope that was really popular. And so I was like, oh, well, you know, we, we're not exactly cowboys in Pennsylvania and Virginia, but I felt like I knew enough about farming and agriculture. I mean, we all talk about the weather like every day we talk about the weather so i felt <laughs> like i can do this you know um because you know that's a big that's that's a big part of a yeah. life is the weather and and there's other things that that are similar across all areas of agriculture so and um i just i felt like that was something that i could do so that's kind of how that like my my life there does but also just um anything that happens in life. I mean, it can all go in a book. I have some shirts, you know, that are like, watch what you say because it could end up in my book, you know, or I'll kill you off or something like that. <laughs> Don't really do that. But yeah, that's, you know, real life is, is, is fiction, you know, mirrors fiction, I guess. Mina. Yeah. You really have to. We'll take a pause. We'll just <laughs> acknowledge that we have a third guest on the podcast. Nina, your dog is joining us as well. <laughs> so if you guys see a fuzzy ear, that's who you're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> Can I brag on my dog a little bit? She just won first place in her obedience class. We took basic obedience. Um, she's seven, but uh, that was her first obedience class and we won first place. So I was like, you know, Nina, you really need to brush up on your obedience skills and show everyone that you're the first place winner here. So. <laughs> yeah, I have, I'm a dog person through and through. I have two dogs at home and my my dog, my husband, anyway, we both came into the marriage with our respective dogs, but my dog is a Husky and he did not win first place in his obedience class. <laughs> Huskies are notoriously not obedient, but <laughs> we still, we, it's more like negotiating with a terrorist. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's a good description. Although Nina really did do terribly at the the first few. She um has anxiety and she ended up in my lap like howling at the top of her lungs because it was so upsetting for her to be there. So I was kind of proud at of how far she had come, but it's definitely not negotiating with a terrorist with so <laughs> that's good. Off my lap now. Um, <laughs> and what about your faith? I I know that your faith is a huge part of your life and the underpinnings of your faith definitely inform the way your characters interact with each other and your exploration of romance and marriage. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit about how that comes into the stories that you tell? Well, I didn't plan to write Christian books to begin with. I didn't always enjoy reading them. They were too like saccharine and not to criticize like that those the books that i read might not have been good books or they just might not have hit me the right way or something but um i i didn't enjoy reading them so i i wasn't planning on writing that but it ended up that it was just pretty much impossible for me to write a story without including my faith in it because that like i don't understand how the world works i guess without that or that's just mm -hmm. the world view that makes sense to me and so mm -hmm. definitely that uh influences everything i write and um it might even influence a little bit why i chose romance um because the picture of a man and a, 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 his wife is supposed to be the relationship between a man and his wife is supposed to be a picture of christ in the church and it's supposed to be a beautiful picture and love is a cornerstone of of Christianity and 
it's supposed to be. I mean, obviously we're humans, we don't do it perfectly, you know? And so in my books, I can show it and in, in its messiness and then kind of show the perfectness too, or the beauty that can be there too, so. Yeah, the redemption of that love. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So what attracts you to the romance storyline and, and why do you love telling stories that include these people coming together? Well, it's what I read. It's what I read growing up. And it is a picture of, of Christ in the church. And so there's that aspect. But I think also it's just um, a positive thing. Um, just I love stories that end happily. In fact, I read the ending of every book that I read because if it doesn't have a happy ending, I mostly don't want to read it, although like where the red fern grows is a little bit, I mean, it kind of had hope at the end, but like, I don't want to read a, a book or watch a movie that just kind of leaves you with a bad feeling. I, mm. I, I think life's too short to, mm. to do that kind of thing, like to, to enjoy the bad feelings. So yeah. romance yeah. is just a happy tro or a happy um, genre and I'm happy to begin it. That's awesome. So as an author, how do you balance really the creative side, the I'm sitting down and I'm working on my manuscript side with the business side, with promoting yourself, with promoting your books? Because um, you get kind of pulled in two different directions and it seems like it would use two different parts of your brain and attention. It really does. It really does. And it's hard to switch between the two of them. I've done things differently too. I mean, you kind of do what works for a while and then your schedule changes and things change and you have to just kind of go with it and, and do what works. But um, lately I've been trying to write in the morning and then in the afternoon or in the evening, I might do the business aspect because whenever I write, I just want to focus on the story. And I do a lot better if I get the story out fast. And probably that's another thing that I do that maybe is a little bit different um, because I write really fast. And so I'll get mm -hmm. the story out and maybe in a week or even a little bit less. And then I'll take a week or two for marketing and for promos and for writing the blurbs and the taglines and doing all the creative stuff that um, you know, is tough to do whenever you're just trying to get the words out, so. So what's your advice for authors who maybe feel a little bit camera shy or don't like to put themselves like front and center or maybe promoting themselves feels like, you know, you're talking a little bit too much about yourself. Like what are some of the techniques that you might use to still get in contact with your audience if you're a little bit more shy? Well, that was uh, definitely me, um, especially when I first started. Um, <laughs> I, I had, didn't have any social media accounts at all before I started writing and being on Facebook was petrifying because, you know, there were people on there and like, I was very happy at home, you know, and not being seen at all. Like I never thought, oh, I'm going to start writing books so that I can, you know, be seen or for the attention or anything. And, um, so that, that was a struggle. And what I ended up doing was a lot of times I, um, would just need to um, back off a little bit, you know, and be like, uh, Facebook is good for today, but at the end of the day, be like, okay, you know what, <sighs> just put it aside, you know, or something, or even for a couple of days, I might do that where it's kind of like, I, I just need a break, I need some downtime. And I, I did kind of feel too, like what you said about, I'm always going, hey, buy my book, look at me, you know, here I am. And even sometimes I still feel like that. And part of the way I got around that, um, it was kind of a twofold thing. COVID happened. And so with my newsletter, I felt kind of exposed because, you know, I'm sending out this buy my book, buy my book all the time. And also with COVID, people were at home more and just kind of were scared and, um, you know, it was an uncertain time. And so I started writing stories from the farm. First of all, we were still packing eggs every day because we were still in Pennsylvania. Yeah, well, we moved to Virginia right as the lockdown started, but be like, hey, we're still packing eggs here. And guess what? You know, I'm doing this crazy thing, you know, and just something silly. And it was easier to put myself out that way, um, just kind of making fun of myself or um, 
not going, hey, look at how what at this wonderful book that I wrote. It's so amazing. You've got to read it more like, hey, I'm on the farm and this is funny. And I know I do it. If I read somebody who, oh, that's a funny story. I bet their books are really good too, you know? So I kind of came in the back door that way. So that that's a way to handle it if, if the idea of doing um, more is scary. And then I think eventually you kind of get used to it, at least I did. And I'm probably way off the, the spectrum for people who are antisocial or whatever. But um, it just, you just, um, gradually, it you get better at it. And so my, my reader group is, uh, I think, 3,000 now. I'm very comfortable posting in there. Like, out, out on regular Facebook, it's still a little bit like, okay, hit publish, and I'm going to go hide under the bed for a half an hour. But, you know, it's not the rest of the day anymore, so that's good, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, the more you're doing it and the more you're connecting with your audience, it's one thing to feel like, oh, I'm posting out into a void, and who cares? And, you know, oh, my gosh, like, you know, it's just an empty black emptiness. There's that too. But when you begin to see that people do want to hear from you, they do like your stories, they like what you have that you're putting out there, then it feels like, oh, okay, I'm giving people something that they really enjoy. And so maybe some of that feeling of like, what the heck, who am I to even do this might might go away over time too, as you get to see that people love your stories. That's absolutely true. The interaction and the reviews and people replying to the newsletter gives you confidence and it makes it so that it's not not quite as hard. It's good. Yeah. Speaking of reviews and confidence building, how do you deal with negative reviews or people coming with critiques? Because coming from the reader space, I'm a reader, I enjoy talking about books online from a reader's perspective. There are times where I see people just rip into books and they can be quite harsh. And even in forums where it's like, you know that the author's gonna see that comment on Goodreads, right? Like, you know, so how do you deal with very, you know, those types of critiques that just are, can be so eviscerating? Um, well, that's a good question. Cause I think at first it was a lot harder than it is kind of now. Um, it, it is a, a little bit, oh, say a little bit, it, it can be devastating whenever, especially whenever they hit something that you're like, oh yeah, I thought that wasn't any good. I knew it wasn't any good, you know, that type of thing. But also I feel like I'm pretty good at taking what someone says, like crit criticism and turning that and being like, okay, I'm going to fix that. You know, that's not going to be a problem later. Um, back before I published, I entered some contests and I wasn't very good. And, um, the one of the contest judges at, on a scale of one to five gave me zeros and they were, they were kind of like and i had based the character on me on the, the heroine of me and she was like the heroine needs psycho psychotic help she belongs in a mental institution you know this this book needs completely rewritten no one's going to read it <laughs> those kinds of you know so it's like okay well i'm never going to base anybody on me again <laughs> but like, those like those things are just things that you need to use to in order to grow so the the negative reviews are hard but uh you can either ignore them if they really set you back or you can just be like oh okay well i didn't realize that i was doing that in my books i need to fix it so i mean mm -hmm. either way is probably okay and i probably do both although i use them more as constructive criticism yeah are there times or how easy is it for you to sort of say like, oh, this person gave me a critique, but I don't agree with it. And so I don't need to take that advice into my next book versus, OK, that was harshly said, but fair point, And I am going to sort of use that to improve my next book. Um, it's pretty it's pretty easy for me now. I don't recall it being super hard either. I mean, sometimes it'll kind of get you pointed in the wrong direction, but from my review team, I encourage them. In fact, they even set up a post today on um, in my review team Facebook group. They're like um, typos, hilarious typos that Jesse has made or something like that. And like they're all putting all of my mistakes on the, and it like funny, you know, because uh, they they know I dictate and I do stuff like that. But like you got to be able to laugh at yourself and just kind of shrug that off. But yeah. also. Like it is important um, 
I think, to to take it the way it's meant. Like um, mm -hmm. when they send me uh, critiques or criticisms, or like, hey, um, you know, you didn't you didn't finish the storyline in the book. You know, where is this guy? This guy was lost, and then you just kind of went somewhere else, and he never got found. And so, like, I, I know they're trying to help me, you know? So yeah. that, to me, is really easy to accept that kind of criticism, especially from my art team. Um, it's a little bit harder maybe from uh, strangers or something. But, I like, if it doesn't if it doesn't make sense for me, I just think, okay, they're not my readers. Like, yeah, my readers, bye, you know? And, and that's yeah. why I don't care about them. It's just not, every, mm -hmm. not everybody loves every book. And I guess maybe it took me a little bit of time to learn that, but that's true. Yeah. Not everybody yeah. loves every single book that they ever read. I don't. And it's not because yeah. the authors are terrible. It's just that that book didn't resonate with me. I like something different. And that's okay, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think you had told me about a review that was left on your Audible previously, where it was just like vomit emoji, vomit emoji, vomit emoji. <laughs> You're like, that's not really constructive criticism, but I guess you didn't like it. <laughs> I was getting that feeling. I think it was like the the sixth emoji, and it's like those colors, you know. They really draw the eye. Yeah. It's like the, the top <laughs> review on that page. So, but the good thing about that review is, whenever we took our, we were um, uh, just with ACX for a while, and we took those down. So you lose all your reviews, which stinks because it's really hard to mm -hmm. get reviews on audios. But the nice thing about that was that review disappeared forever. So. We didn't have to look at the vomit emojis anymore. No, no, I didn't even get a screenshot, so I can't even like look back at on it and laugh. Yeah. yeah. So are there other genres that you're itching to write in, itching to explore more? Um, well, I besides Cowboy and Beach, I did a um, series of ROMs that you had mentioned in The Good Grief, Idaho. Um, and I'd really like to write ROMs again because it was just a lot of fun. And it's just fun to have people be like, oh, I laughed so hard, I woke my husband up, you know? <laughs> it's just fun to make people laugh. But um, yeah, that, I kind of would love to do women's fiction too, just because I really love those kind of psychological themes and that type of thing. And I, I do think that that's kind of, a, maybe I'm getting older and that's maybe more of an interest to me. So those mm -hmm. would be probably, I've already done the ROMs. I'd, I'd love to do some more, and then yeah. inspection. So, I think with your sense of humor, which uh, your next book that's coming out is a cowboy's gentle touch, and I had the opportunity to read it. And even your humor is intertwined, even with your cowboy series. And I think that definitely more rom coms. I, I can totally imagine that that would be a great hit with your sense of humor. And I'd definitely be curious to to learn more from your your experience as a woman too. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I thank you. I I would really love to do that. So hopefully <laughs> my, my sense of humor is more like a 12 year old boy than anything but <laughs> sometimes, but yeah. So as a reader, what are some of your favorite books to read and how do they inform you as a writer as well? Well, I used to read a lot of romance and I still read some occasionally, but I am, I really have gravitated toward nonfiction. I always liked it, and that's pretty much what I read almost exclusively now. Um, adventure stories, uh, that type of thing. And I love stories like uh, where people display character and courage and integrity. And that, that's you, you see that a lot in war stories. So I read a lot about mm. War II and the Civil War and just kind of stuff like that. Um, I love the behind the scene, behind the scenes stories. Um, for some reason, I'm really drawn to uh, mountaineering stories, which I don't understand because I'm never going to climb a mountain. I guarantee it, you know. And but I I read Into Thin Air and just love that, and then Into the Void and those kinds of stories. Like they're yeah. just fascinating to me. And I think that that informs my fiction because. I love the character and the integrity and the courage and the willingness to sacrifice and maybe not for, uh, you know, this being able to reach the summit of a mountain, but being able to, you know, be a good father or be a good wife or do the right thing in a difficult situation and overcome obstacles mm -hmm. in order to find love. So, yeah, it sacrifices 
also a big theme in A Cowboy's Gentle Touch, and I know you've mentioned that it's important for you to explore that in so many of your stories. And in that case, Luke, our main character, he has to make a pretty big sacrifice for the good of his family, for um, you know their future, and it definitely is is a challenge for him. And it's um, you have to kind of ride that wave and see what the outcome is and how it affects him. Yeah, yeah, and she actually makes a pretty big sacrifice too, um, with in order to save him. And yeah, sacrifice is definitely something that that shows up in a lot of my in my books. And I think it, the mirror there is Christ's sacrifice for us. And yeah. it's just um, something that I love to, to show because it's it's almost like a human. It's a human thing just to admire that so much. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you have any suggestions for books uh, for other aspiring authors or maybe uh, maybe they're deep in their career, I don't know, um, to read that you think would be really helpful for their craft or kind of go-to books for you that you kind of return to and say like, oh, this has really helped me become a better writer? Yeah. Um, when I first started out, I think it's pretty timeless, um, a couple of books. Sometimes things change, especially marketing books. So it's, you, that, that's kind of, you need to make sure that stays up to date. But I read a book by Cheryl St. John. I think it was emo Writing with Emotion, Tension and Conflict or something like that. And that just really, I, I just loved her writing style. I love her, um, the books that I've read of hers and her her nonfiction writing style just really hit me. She has another one about writing writing happy or something like that that I really loved. But Susan May Warren has some good books out too about structure and that type of thing. So those are probably the two biggest books, but I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about how many craft books and writing books and all of those kinds of books that I've read. Probably, I mean, I've read a lot. So, yeah. I don't think you should be embarrassed. I think, you know, anybody who's practicing their craft who is cares about their audience, cares about the, you know, output. I think we all spend time trying to improve over time and intake, you know, good advice. I think that's you know, that I wouldn't want my doctor to stop learning. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hopefully people are not like, looking to me to, to heal them. So. Well, I'm going to counteract you on that because I find literature quite healing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do um, read craft books. And it's actually, if you're having writers, if I'm having writer's block or even feeling a little bit burnout or something, those kinds of books are really helpful to me to read too because it's like, oh, mm. you forgot about that. And oh, I could. Yeah. So those are really helpful to do. To, to go back. Yeah, get a little inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to try that. Yeah. So what does your writing process look like? Like on a day-to-day, -day, how do you fit it into your day? What does that look like? You know, you get up in the morning, <laughs> go. What does Jesse's day look like? <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy. I wish it happened like that. Um, but it doesn't. Um, every day is different. Um, I, I hinted about it a little bit earlier, kind of that I'm a binge writer. So mm -hmm. I don't write every day. So there is that there there is that commality in um, in in my days. But um, I write best in the morning. And so if I'm going to get a lot of words in, I definitely need to start in the morning. Although I really kind of surprised myself the other day, and I wrote. 15,000 words after lunch. And that was kind of big for me because typically after lunch, it's like, ah, oh, well, tomorrow's another day, you know, or something like that. But um, so it's possible now that I know that it's possible, I'll probably try to do it more often. But um, I write in the morning a good bit, but there's farm chores, there's kids, I'm homeschooling a kid. So um, every day is different. I think that's okay. You know, like I would really love to, and maybe someday I will have the opportunity to get up and no one will need me and I'll get up and go to my writing area and write what I feel like, and I'll have a dream day and that'll be really nice. But right now that's not my life. So, yeah. Do you mind if I ask you, like, what has changed for you kind of personally and internally that you've chosen to share of your creative gift through writing, you know? Has that changed you as a person to go from not telling these stories to telling them? 
Well, I'll tell you what's really changed me. And I guess I haven't, I, I've thought about it a little bit because it's, when I look at myself, I, I see that I'm different. It's the readers um, mm. that have changed me. And a lot of it is because of the books I write, um, being Christian books, and they'll be like, oh, you know, that, that really hit home for me. And either I, I come away feeling really blessed that that isn't my life, or I come away feeling like I have this huge responsibility, you know, mm -hmm. because you change someone's life, you know, you, you pointed them to Jesus. And that's probably the biggest thing when someone says that to me, that's probably the best thing that they could say to me. But that has made me a lot more aware of, I need to be better, you know, like it's, mm. I need to, I mean, I've always felt a really strong need to live what I believe because just saying words doesn't mean anything. Anybody can say words. So I've always felt really strong about that. But now whenever I know I'm doing something wrong, I'll think, oh my goodness, if my readers found out about this, they would be really disappointed in me, you know? So there's mm -hmm. that burden, you know, not burden. There's that encouragement for me to want to run my race well so that mm. other people can run their race well. Um, so do you do a lot of research for your books or do these ideas kind of come like you're saying from the books that you've read or from your personal experience? And then what else do you add into the mix if you're like trying to look for a plot point or make something work for characters to get to their where they need to go in their story? Um, my books are all contemporary and they're mostly cowboy and so i don't have to do a whole lot of research unless they have a occupation that i don't know about so then i have to do some research but even then um it's kind of touch and go on on the internet and i just a funny example we have um akaushi cows which are a japanese breed which i had never worked with before but they're they're a beef breed and researching on the internet, they're like, oh, you know, they're so gentle and they're so nice. And they're just this really sweet, wonderful breed. And like they were right about the meat characteristics that they marvel really well and that type of thing. But with the personalities, my first uh, experience with uh, hurting one of them was we had brought it in. It was like 11 o'clock at night. We we're bringing it home. The guy had brought it from Texas and three of them from Texas. And we got out of the truck and um, we we left her out of the trailer and there was just a small spot in the gate. My husband just swung the gate open and he didn't follow it through. So there was a small spot where I was standing. I mean, any normal cow would have just gone in the pasture field. Well, she saw that hole in the fence and she came for it. And like I was standing there with a flashlight and I'm like, oh, my goodness. OK, so, I'm, whoa, you know go back to the other way and like a normal cow would have been like oh there's a big scary lady there like my kids all say I'm very scary and she would have, it would have turned around and run the other way this cow lowered her head and charged me and I was like okay so these are not nice nice little happy little Japanese cows in the pasture field these were like man eaters and she like chased me the whole way around that she was gonna <laughs> eat me but I got away from her and my husband thought it was hilarious and then, you know, she chased him later, which I had to sit and laugh at him, so. <laughs> well, do you have, so now I have to ask, is there ever a scene of cow chasing in any of your stories yet? Have you used that yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, actually, I think, yeah, <laughs> the whole plot point. Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, it wasn't an Akiyushi cow, it was, a, it was a new mama with a new baby, but yeah, the, that's. Yep. So yeah. <laughs> Life imitates art, imitates life, <laughs> That's as right. they say. We want to hear about your research into the dark web because, uh, and I don't want to give anything away, but there is a plot point involving a character. Um, you know what? I am the least techie person ever, like ever. Um, you know, I can't even turn on our TV set in our home, and I am not even kidding about that. And I, I turn it off by unplugging it, and then I have to remember to plug it <laughs> so I don't upset my husband. But yeah, so <laughs> I know about the dark web because of the nonfiction that I read. I forget where I read it in a nonfiction book, but yeah, that was <laughs> that was definitely something. And I was like, oh yeah, I can kind of sound like knowledgeable about this, right? 
Now I have to ask you the question where you get to do a little jazz hands and do the, I'm promoting myself as an author. <laughs> what titles and projects and new releases do you have coming out that you're excited about that you'd like your audience to know about? <laughs> Someone asked me this the other day and I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know when this is going to come out and I release so often that it, it is a little bit hard to say. Um, today is Tuesday and on Friday I have a new release. Um, and I, I'm always hesitant to say because I get the I get the names of my children mixed up. Like they have to check their birth certificates when they got to a certain age to make sure what their names actually were. And uh, my books can't do that, so I just misrepresent them all the time. But I have a new release on Friday. I think it's a Cowboy's Gentle Touch. And it's, <laughs> okay, yes, great. Oh, yay, yay me. <laughs> um, so a Cowboy Gentle, it's coming out on audio and it should be out in paperback, maybe even large print and ebook, of course. So there's that. And then there's one more book in that series and we're gonna go to the beach then. So there's lots of things to look forward to this year. I'm, I'm ready for it. Summer's coming. I'm looking forward to some beachy reads. I know that that's coming up on my TBR here soon mm -hmm. as well. And then ultimately, where can readers find you? Where can they find your books? If they're interested in listening to the audiobook, where would they find that? Well, the audiobooks are easy. Jay has a YouTube channel. It's Say with Jay. Um, super easy. And all of my books actually... <clears throat> We're coming up on a hundred books that we've done together, and all of them are available on Say With Jay. Uh, almost all of them. There's maybe a dozen that he doesn't have up there. So that is, and they're all free. All you have to do is be on YouTube and you can listen for free to all of my books. So that's probably the absolute best place. And of course they're available on Amazon. I do have a store, but it's, I, I need to work on it a little bit, but you can buy direct from me, but you'll have to probably contact me. Um, mm. So Amazon, and they're available. I have some available on um, Kobo and Barnes and Noble and Apple and Spotify. I think Jay even has some audios up on Spotify, not all, so anywhere. Yeah. And we'll have all the links down below so people can find everything and find you online and everything. Jesse, thank you so much for being on our podcast today and sharing with us not only about your personal life and your faith and how that all gets imbued in your stories, but also great advice for other authors who are aspiring authors who want to follow in your footsteps and share their stories too. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me. It was, it was a fun time, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs>